I hope I'm recording. I hope I'm recording, but I'll, I guess I'll know at the, at the very end. You're recording, aren't you? Yeah, we are recording. Yes. Well, worst comes to worst, you can send me your file. Let me just make sure we are. I'm not be nervous now. Yeah, we're we're recording. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> worst, worst comes to worst, you can send me your file, and I'll upload it to my YouTube channel. Yeah, yes. I will send it to you. Yeah. And then you can cut out whatever you want if you feel we said no, something I never, weird. Over. I never, I never edit. I, I oh. upload raw. Oh, wow. Nice. I, I'm a big believer in authenticity. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. We, nice. Uh, we are very, we're very happy that you are joining us here today. I'm happy to join you. Thank you. <laughs> and we think that your views on uh, narcissism is very interesting and it has helped us so much in our healing process. I'm glad, glad I could be of help. And I agree. I think my views on narcissism are interesting also. <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and we also want to shed more light on this topic here in Norway. Because uh, we think that we have had a lot of people coming to us and say that, oh, we're experiencing the same thing. And um, it's not... Would you, not would you characterize Norwegian society in general as narcissistic? No, not no. at all. No, the opposite. Not at all? Yeah. The opposite yeah. of narcissistic? Okay. Yeah, but I've yeah. been living 20 years in LA, in Los Angeles. So you right. kind of almost have to be a narcissist or have the traits to survive. Yeah. But I'm yeah. back now in Norway. I just went through a horrible relationship and I couldn't do it anymore. So, and then when I got back, I realized Mari here also been through the same thing. So we started a po after watching, she introduced me actually to your videos. And after watching that, we started on podcast about mm. the topic. Because it's not in Norway and everybody's in yeah. shock here. They didn't even know such a thing existed almost. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. I'm 44 years old and I've never experienced it until one year ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was in shock. Sounds yeah. like a narcissist safe haven. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, we think that the way you explain these personality traits is very fascinating and eye opening. Thank and you. when we when we watched your videos, I was like, oh my god, this it, yeah, it helped me a lot. Yeah, she started yeah. sending me your videos and we both got obsessed like looking at it every day. <laughs> We've yeah. seen probably all of your videos. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. I do suggest, however, that we transition from narcissistic supply, <laughs> which yeah. I'm enjoying which I'm enjoying greatly, to the interview itself, so that other people can benefit as well yeah yes we hope so yeah and i just love the way you explain it it's so you're so rational about it there's no that swishy is, that, that is still, it's that straight is to still, the point yeah that is still narcissistic supply for me <laughs> so <Is> it, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's transition from compliments to to conversation yeah what is it that you would like to discuss i'm at your disposal so i would love to know why can't the narcissist love you and and we also want to know uh, why the relationship with a narcissist is so complicated it's always so much drama and it, it can it's never like be coaster. like yeah these are actually two easy questions the answer <laughs> to the answer to your question diana narcissists cannot love you because narcissists are incapable of having any positive emotions it's not that they do not have positive emotions they possess positive emotions like every other human being it is that they are denied access to these emotions they are incapable of accessing these emotions and the reason is that in early childhood they have learned to associate positive emotions with shame with hurt mm -hmm. with pain mm -hmm. with rejection with being ignored or abandoned or neglected or instrumentalized or parentified in short they learn to associate positive emotions, for example, loving mommy. They learn to associate it with negative outcomes, with bad mm -hmm. feelings. Mm -hmm. So they have learned via conditioning, clinical term is operant conditioning. They have been conditioned to suppress and repress their positive emotions. Consequently, mm -hmm. they're incapable of loving anyone or actually anything. <laughs> they can never emotionally invest in anything, a process known as cathexis. They cannot cathect anything. Cathexis is a much larger uh, term. It incorporates love, but it also incorporates a persistent attention, emotional investment in projects and goals, um, attachment 
attachment to places, attachment to language, attachment to your personal history, to your family, and so on. So narcissists are incapable of any of these things, not only love. Narcissists are incapable of attachment. They're incapable of bonding, and so on and so forth. So this, in a nutshell, is the answer to your question. It's not that they are malevolent or this, these are psychopaths. Mm -hmm. people, people, especially people online, especially self-styled experts online, often confuse narcissists with psychopaths. Psychopaths okay. are scheming. Psychopaths are scheming, they're manipulative, they're goal-oriented. Narcissists are just who they are. Mm -hmm. Very often, the outcome is the same. Having a relationship with a psychopath and having a relationship with a narcissist may end up feeling the same. But mm -hmm. it's not the same in the sense that the psychopath is out there to exploit you somehow. He wants something from you. Could be sex, could be money, could be access, could be power, could be fame, could be anything. Could be your home <laughs> or your money. Yeah. Could be anything. The, and so the, the psychopath is goal-oriented and once the goal is accomplished, he loses all interest in you. He loses all interest in you even in the, in the negative way. He wouldn't stalk you. He wouldn't hoover you. He wouldn't, you know, he would just let you go. The narcissist, on the other hand, creates a fantasy and it's known as the shared fantasy and then he embeds you in this fantasy he wants you to play a role in this fantasy and if you refuse to play this role or if you're not up to the role then he gets very angry and frustrated and aggressive and then he devalues you and discards you there are, there's there are psychodynamic reasons for devaluing you and discard you you represent his mother in the relationship and he wants to separate from you but again, there's, there's a difference between narcissists and psychopaths. Narcissists are not malevolent. They're not malicious. That's a myth. Psychopaths are. Mm -hmm. Marie, can you remind me of your question? Yeah, um, that's kind of a big question, I think. But we want to know why the relationship is so complicated. The drama. It's so not complicated at all. It is the victims, com <laughs> the victims complicate the relationship. The narcissist expects, yeah, yeah. narcissist expects full obedience, expects you to yeah. conform. He expects yeah. you to conform to your role in the shared fantasy. Mm -hmm. He expects you to um, not deviate and not diverge from the idealized image of you that he has in his mind. It is mm -hmm. known as introject, internal object. So mm -hmm. if you are compliant, if you're submissive, if you obey, if you follow instructions, if you're a good soldier, the relationship is exceedingly simple and very frequently rewarding. <laughs> it is when the victim, when the victim displays signs of independence, autonomy, agency, having a life of her own, deviating mm. and diverging from the idealized image of, that the narcissist has of her, mm. disagreeing with the narcissist, criticizing the narcissist, offering advice, offering help, being nice to the narcissist. A no, no, that's a very bad strategy. Well, the, <laughs> yeah. oh my God, yeah. And this complicates the relationship. So, the, all the complications in the relationships with narcissists are brought into the relationship by victims, not by yeah. the narcissist. But, Sam, just one thing then why would they choose? Like, why would my cho mind choose me when I don't know how to cook or clean? Or, and then that's what he wanted. Why would you choose someone who's opposite of what you want? Narcissists are looking for four things in an intimate partner, and not only in an intimate partner, by the way, um, almost in everyone, four things. Mm -hmm. And they are the four S's. So sex, services, supply, narcissistic or sadistic, and safety. If you are able to provide two out of these four, then, mm -hmm. then you get the job. Lucky you. <laughs> Okay, you. Yeah. you get the job. So if you offer, for example, sex and safety, you get the job even if you don't know how to cook. Right. <laughs> okay. If on the other hand, if on the right. other hand, you offer cooking and personal assistant, personal assistant roles and chauffeur, and you know, you right. provide, if, if if you offer services and you provide them reliably on call with no murmur and no objections and so on and at the same time you offer safety so services and safety 
even if you refuse to have sex with a narcissist, you would still be his intimate partner. Only, oh, wow. only two or four, every two or four, every combination of two out of four is sufficient for the narcissist. Now, of course, there are several types of narcissists. There's overt mm -hmm. and there's covert, also known as vulnerable, fragile narcissist. There is somatic narcissist and cerebral narcissist and so on and so forth. So if you are unable to offer sex, but you cook well, and you are a stable intimate partner, so you create a sense of safety, you're likely to attract a cerebral narcissist mm -hmm. because cerebral narcissists are not into sex. They aggrandize themselves via intellectual accomplishments. Mm -hmm. If on the other hand, you're, you're a borderline, for example, you emphasize your appearance and your sexuality, but you're not very good at cooking and you're not very safe, but still, you provide the narcissist with narcissistic supply. You tell him how great he is, how amazing he is, and you give him the best sex ever. So you fulfill two out of the four. But you're likely to attract to attract a somatic narcissist. The somatic narcissist places emphasis on his body and the uses he can make of his body. And yeah, he was a bodybuilder. Yeah. Bodybuilder, sex, anything that involves the body. Wow, that's so crazy! Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I gave all those four things you <laughs> she did all four, <laughs> but uh, somehow nothing was good enough. Even if I gave all those things, there was always something that he complained about and caused more drama. Um, I didn't say. I, I didn't say hmm? that he. I did not say that if you give these these things you would have a long-term relationship. Yeah. I said I said that if you give these things, you would qualify as an intimate partner. Yeah. However, all relationships with narcissists end up with devaluation. Mm. Not always with discard, but always with devaluation. And the reason for this has nothing to do with you. The reason for this is the fact that a narcissist has had a very complicated relationship with his mother and you represent his mother, you're a maternal figure, and he has to reenact these early conflicts and drama with his mother, with you. It's a second chance at a second childhood with a second mother. And so what he, what he had wanted to do with his original mother was to separate from her and become an individual, and he had failed. He never succeeded to separate from his biological mother, and he never succeeded to become an individual. And here you are, and he says, well, that's my second chance. I'm going to separate from this woman and I'm going to become an individual. And because she is my second mother, this time I will get it right. And mm -hmm. so to separate from you, he needs to devalue you. Devaluation has nothing to do with you. It's an internal, integral process in the narcissist's mind that mm -hmm. would play regardless of your behavior, choices, decisions, and so on. This is something the victims don't understand. The narcissist, the dynamic of the narcissist relationship with his intimate partner, these dynamics are dictated from the inside. They are not reactive. They are not what we call exogenous. They are not reactive to outside factors. Therefore, who you are is completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It is a myth. It is a myth online that narcissists are attracted to empathic women loving women, caring oh, wow. women, that is nonsense. That is not true. Because narcissists don't care about empathy and they cannot do intimacy. So they don't give a, you know, <laughs> on whether you're intimate and empathic. They focus on the four S's. And mm. then they need you to be able to emulate a maternal figure. A maternal figure doesn't have to be caring and empathic. Actually, the narcissist wants you to be not caring and not empathic, rejecting. He wants you to be his, his mother. His mother was a rejecting figure, what we call in psychology a dead mother, emotionally absent, selfish, depressive, a user, an exploiter, neglecting, and so on. So he wants you to be the same because this would make the devaluation phase easier for him. Mm -hmm. If you are intimate, if you are loving, if you are caring, it infuriates him. 
you're frustrating him by being nice. Yeah. When you're nice, it's frustrating because it doesn't allow you to devalue you, allow, allows him to devalue you. Yeah. Here I am, I want to devalue you and you're nice to me. You're doing it on purpose. You're passive aggressive. You're not letting me devalue you. You bad, <laughs> you bad yeah. partner. So yeah. That's very people, online, people online are getting it completely wrong, completely reverse. Yeah. Most, yeah. most, people, most YouTubers and so on, they're getting it completely wrong. It's an avalanche. It's, and they're getting it wrong because the victims want to aggrandize themselves. The victims are also a bit narcissistic. Not all of them, but many of them. And so they want to feel special. They want to feel that they have been chosen. They want to feel that they are super empathic, amazingly caring, un, uh, incredibly loving, unprecedentedly soft and accepting, and so on. But that's nonsense. The narcissist would devalue you in any case. And he would prefer if you help him to devalue you, which is precisely why narcissists are attracted to borderlines. Borderlines are drama queens. Borderlines <laughs> introduce into their relationships. Borderlines introduce into their relationships a lot of, you know, bad events. Um, they misbehave. They are dramatic. They're unpredictable. They are frustrating. They're infuriating. Some of them, not all of them, cheat habitually. This is great. That's exactly what the narcissist needs because it makes it easier for him to devalue the borderline and get rid of her. Yeah. And then to feel for a while, for a little while, that this time he got it right, he's separated from mummy, and he can be his own man. And so yeah. narcissist or, or woman, 50% yeah. of all narcissists are women. Everything I'm yeah. saying applies equally to women. Yeah. Nowadays, unfortunately, it's a new phenomenon. <laughs> it's a new phenomenon because women were underrepresented uh, only 40 years ago. 40 years ago, 76% of people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder were men. There, was, yeah. there were almost no women involved. Today, one third of psychopaths are, are women and one half of uh, narcissists are, men, are women and about 60% of borderlines are women. So women are taking over a cluster B diagnosis. And of course, a vast majority of histrionics are women. So if you look at the overall picture of cluster B, the majority are women, not men. Wow. Everything I'm saying applies to women. Yeah. And it's true what you said. I felt like even though I learned how to cook, it almost like he was happy for a week, but then it was back to like, there's something else is wrong or you just cook one time and you think you're this and that. And it, it never ends. Like whatever you do is like, what do you like? It's like kind of one of what's, the videos what's with we're the talking about being a robot. Like, you want me to be a robot? Like, it was like nothing is good enough. Like, oh but, my god. Uh, but what's with the cooking? Why this obsession with cooking? <laughs> no, because he think... because I can't, and then he felt like I was spoiled. And and... Cooking cooking defines you as a woman or as a person or what? I don't why know. Did for buy, him, why did like, you buy? Yeah, he... I was stupid. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I never should have. Bought? But I. You know what happened was because my last relationship, I was the opposite. So I was thinking maybe that was wrong. So I was thinking, oh, maybe he is right because I was confused from the last because the last one was a covert narcissist, which I didn't know he was until I was with this one. After this mm -hmm. one, I realized, oh, my God, like they were the same in a different way, like different types of narcissists. So I was just in shock. And yeah, I'm probably a narcissist right now myself, I feel <laughs> like. No, you're not. It's been since February. She, she's not narcissist. <laughs> no, but it's been since February. But I feel like I got some of those traits. Like, that's why it's yeah. scary to watch you. I can tell, like, the stuff you're saying. I can feel it. I feel everything you're saying. Well, when you're trying to defend yourself against the narcissist coercion, because yeah. the narcissist coerces you to conform to your idealized image in his mind. And then he coerces you to participate in the shared fantasy. And then it coerces you to be a bad partner. And then he coerces you to become an enemy, the secretary object. It's all about coercion. The entire relationship with the narcissist is from A to Z, 100% coercion. You are punished if you don't conform. You are penalized if you're too independent. It's all punitive. It's a punitive relationship. So to defend yourself simply, to protect yourself, you react in kind. This is known as reactive abuse. You react in kind. You become abusive. You become narcissistic. You even become psychopathic 
this is all an attempt to survive within the relationship to somehow yeah. somehow maintain your boundaries somehow not allow him to take over totally brainwash you to the point that you no longer exist mm, the narcissist exactly. the narcissist wants to abscond with your existence he wants you to not exist anymore because mm. he creates an internal object that represents you in his mind and then he continues to interact with this internal object and then you become a nuisance because you keep contradicting the internal object so he wants you to become like the internal object static dead literally dead yeah. the ideal the ideal intimate partner for a narcissist um was depicted in a in a film a film the famous film psycho alfred alfred hitchcock's film okay. norman bates norman bates runs a small motel motel and yeah. his mother his mother is dead so what norman bates does in the morning he walks up to her bedroom he kept the body he mummified the body of his mother he walks up to her bedroom he takes he washes her he takes her out of bed and he seats her on a on a chair facing the window that's in the morning in the evening he walks up to her bedroom he kisses her on the forehead he puts her back to bed and that's the ideal partner for a narcissist yes <laughs> and oh. whenever you show signs of life that's a challenge it undermines the internal object now narcissists are as kernberg has observed not vaknin narcissists are psychotic so narcissists live in, inside their minds whenever you threaten any element in the narcissist mind you threaten the totality of the narcissist universe you are not just threatening your the image of you in his mind the internal object that represents you your avatar you're not just doing this you're undermining the principle of action the organizing principle of the narcissist world because what have you if you don't conform to your idealized internal object mm -hmm. then something is wrong with the internal object it's the internal object is not getting you right but wait a minute if something is wrong with one internal object maybe something is wrong with all internal objects and if something is wrong with all internal objects there's no universe for the narcissist because he never exists in the outside narcissists never interact with external objects so kernberg said otto kernberg is kind of the father of the field kernberg said justly so and i humbly continued his work but Ken kernberg said that narcissists are narcissism is probably the second most extreme form of mental illness after schizophrenia and i tend to agree i tend to fully agree i think people including experts including scholars including everyone they're underestimating what is narcissism they say ah oh, narcissist is an asshole sorry for the for the word yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. just an asshole you know he's a jerk he's just a jerk and you know you have to you have to learn how to live with jerks because they are multiplying and reproducing nowadays so you just have to know how to live with them you can manipulate the narcissist easily it's not a big problem they they minimize and probably possibly they minimize because many of them are narcissists it's not a conspiracy theory the narcissists are overrepresented in the medical professions that's a fact so do psychopaths so that's also a fact these are the studies of hair and babyak and campbell and twenge so it's not a conspiracy theory to say that narcissists who happen to be psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists and authors of book about psychology books about psychology that they would minimize narcissism but narcissism is a severe super severe mental illness combining elements from literally every non every other known mental illness the narcissist has elements of bipolar disorder he has elements of schizophrenia he has elements of borderline personality disorder mm -hmm. he has elements of psychopath of antisocial personality disorder psychopathy mm -hmm. he has elements of paranoid personality disorder he has elements of schizoid personality disorder he has elements mm -hmm. of depression he has elements of elements of anxiety disorders the narcissist is the dsm he is a walking talking version of the diagnostic and statistical manual 
literally every mental illness known to humanity combined becomes narcissistic personality disorder. It's a really, really serious mental illness. Yeah, but, but uh, yeah, how hmm. can they, you know, uh, function like they, they live normal lives they they wake up in the morning they go to work they do all activities and they seem very normal and it's very easy to, you know to ig ignore the red flags in the beginning also also crying when they when you're watching a movie with them they're crying like whoa you would think they're empathetic or empathic you know yeah I mean? yeah that's puzzles they, me they have, <laughs> learned. they have learned as children to emulate yeah. to emulate normalcy empathy <laughs> and mm -hmm. even to Im even to imitate emotions and narcissism is an extreme form of mimicry yeah it's very much like an insect which pretend pretends to be another insect or an insect that pretends to be a leaf or a branch of a tree you know, this is mimicry extreme form of mimicry. so narcissists have learned these skills in order to to survive I'm not the first to say this. There was a guy called Harvey Cleckley. And Harvey Cleckley in 1942 wrote a magnificent masterpiece. Uh, it's titled The Mask of Sanity. He said that narcissists and psychopaths, they were a mask. And it's a mask of sanity. However, I disagree that their lives are normal. Their lives are yes. not normal. They are very itinerant, very pathetic. They transition between many jobs and many marriages and many relationships. They have severe difficulties with intimacy. I wouldn't say their lives are normal. Moreover, it's relatively easy, if you know what you're doing, it's relatively easy to expose the narcissist behind the mask. It's re uh, the narcissist is hypervigilant. In other words, the narcissist keeps looking. Who is insulting me? Who is attacking me? Who is, yeah. you know... So he's a bit paranoid, he has paranoid yeah. ideation, and he scans yeah. all the time. He scans using something called something that I dubbed called empathy. So he scans everyone to see where is going, where is the attack going to come from? Who is gonna where are the slights and the insults and yeah. the humiliation? Where's the humiliation gonna come from? And so on and so forth. He's shame-based. Narcissism is shame-based. So it's very easy to say something to the narcissist, if you know what you're doing, and even if you don't know what you're doing, it's easy to say something to the narcissist, and he suddenly switches. He literally yeah. switches. It's like multiple personality, or yeah, diso uh, dissociative identity disorder. He suddenly becomes enraged, impulsive, reckless, defiant, contumacious, rejects authority, uh, utterly out of control, and so on and so forth. Now, this process is known as switching. And I proposed a theory based on Bromberg, Philip Bromberg's work, that actually narcissists and so on, they have self-states. They don't have a self. They don't have a unitary self. But they have a fragmented self. And they have self-states. And what happens is, with every stimulus from the environment, they switch between one self-state to another. And the same with borderline. Now, this makes it much easier to explain narcissism. If you insist that a narcissist has a unitary self, then how do you explain the amazing switching between, between what looks definitely like different, different personalities? But if you accept that he has self-states which are mutually exclusive, albeit communicating, the self-states are communicating, not, not like in multiple personality. In multiple personality, there's the different alters, the self-states don't communicate. They don't share memories. They don't have the same identity. In the narcissist, the assemblage of self-states have common memories. They access the same databases and so on. But depending on the stimulus from the environment, one of the self-states will take over. The most effective, self-efficacious self-state will take over. So you could see the narcissist transitioning from a self-state that imitates empathy and intimacy and emotions and cries in movies and whatever you you can see a narcissist suddenly switching to a self state, which is psychopathic, callous, mm. ruthless, merciless, mm. you know, uh, and would do anything, trample on people, kill, steal. I mean, you, you can see this. Anyone who has lived with a narcissist will tell you this. Anyone. Yeah. Who has lived.
And any therapist who has ever worked with an artist will tell you this. That's interesting, yeah. Mary. Uh, and then, so when they say, well, mine said he loved me after it was over, but when they say they love you, like, is that just something they're saying or? No. They don't even know what that is or? They mislabel, they mislabel internal processes mm -hmm. as, do, as do borderlines. There's a problem of mislabeling. It's called attribution. The clinical term is attribution error. So they misattribute internal processes to emotions. So for example, if a narcissist will tell you, I love you, when he's actually telling you, I miss what you used to give me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Always. The supply. And if borderline, a borderline tells you, I love you, she is actually saying, I miss the sense of safety and regulation that you afforded me when we were together. Because when I was with you, I felt stable, I felt safe, I felt at peace. You took care of my emotions. You took care of my moods. You took care of my reality. You were my reality. You were, and borderlines often say, you are my life. You are my world. <laughs> and it's true. This is called external regulation. So you just have to translate. There needs to be a dictionary. Great idea, by the way. I should get to work on it. It needs to be a dictionary. Like when he says this, he means this. So right. when he says, I love you, he means, I miss the things you used to give me. Give me, yeah. Kind of. yeah. Yeah. And as I love how you said, there's no, nobody's a victim. Like we are participating in this also, uh, mm -hmm. in this drama, whatever you want to call it. So what, what advice would you get give, if not victims, but us like recovering from all the trauma we've been through with a narcissist? First of all, it is expressly untrue that you don't realize that something is wrong until much later. Yeah. People realize that something is wrong on the first meeting, usually within the first few minutes. It is just that they, <laughs> it is just that they are compelled to deny. They're compelled to deny it, to reframe it, to tell themselves all kinds of stories, to convince themselves that you know it's passing, it's special circumstances, it's, he, was, he was tired after work, or he had mm. a difficult childhood, or, you know. Yeah. Victims lie to themselves all the time. Victims self-deceive all the time from the first minute they come across a narcissist. Actually, studies have shown that when you are not inclined to develop an intimate relationship with a narcissist, when you just meet a narcissist socially, or you come across a narcissist at work, so there's no question of being intimate partners, yeah? Uh, studies have shown that people feel ill at ease. They feel uncomfortable within seconds of coming across the narcissist. This is known mm -hmm. as the uncanny valley phenomenon. Wow. Narcissists mm -hmm. and psychopaths, but not borderlines. Narcissists and psychopaths make you feel uncomfortable within seconds if you are not into... I'm looking for a partner. Oh. So loneliness is a poison. Loneliness yeah. drives you to compromise to the extent of denying yourself and denying all the information that you're getting from the environment. You're falsifying the environment in order not to be alone anymore or to have yeah. a partner or to fall in love. Some people are in love with the process of falling in love. They're in love with love, you know? Yeah. yeah. So this is the first thing. It is not true that you don't have all the information you need within the first five minutes. You do. Second thing. Second thing is, if you have already been traumatized by a narcissist once or more, and frequently it's much more, much more often. Yeah. A, a typical victim of narcissists would usually go through three to five relationships with narcissists. Yeah. A typical victim. Yeah. And eight and ten are not uncommon. Not yeah, with the same partner. Yeah. Same type yeah. of partner, yes. Yeah. Same type of partner. And of course, the reason is simple. Victims of narcissists are usually themselves. They usually come from an environment which has been in some way deficient or defective, problematic mm -hmm. in some way. The narcissist and the victim share the same background. Absolutely the same background. Narcissist is a victim of abuse. I'm going to repeat this. The narcissist is a victim of abuse yeah. as an, uh, in early childhood. So that's why the narcissist knows how to resonate with you in a way that no other person can. 
because he knows where you're coming from. He has been there. He's done that. He is you. He is you. And this leads to processes known as enmeshment or merger or fusion. When you become two of you, become one in a kind of cult, become one. Because the boundaries between the two of you are porous. They are they're permeable. And they're permeable because you recognize, if you wish, a twin soul. <laughs> I hate these phrases, but kind of, just to illustrate. You know? So you need to give up on many things in order not to fall again in the trap of a relationship with the narcissist. You need to give up on being understood. You need to okay. give up on being accepted. You need to give up on the excitement and the drama. You need to give up on many things which are very critical to you. So many, many women, and it's especially women, refuse to compromise. They say, yeah, you know, he may be abusive, but he loves me in a way that no one else has ever loved me. Or I see myself through his gaze the way I've never seen myself through any other man's gaze. You know? I see myself idealized. It's irresistible. It's a mother's gaze. The narcissist's gaze is a mother's gaze. It's the way a mother looks at her newborn baby. A mother needs to idealize the baby because raising children sucks big time. <laughs> so yeah. you need to lie to yourself that they are wonderful creatures. They're not wonderful creatures, they're narcissists. Babies are narcissists. That's not me, that's Sigmund Freud. So your first relationship with a narcissist is with your children. These, they are not, they've been narcissists for two, three years. And yet you had to lie to yourself that they're not narcissists, that they're adorable, <laughs> that they are ideal. And so, <laughs> so, yeah. so this is, this is a kind of training for relationships with narcissists. But you need to sacrifice a lot because for victims, for most victims, to be with a narcissist is to feel alive. They make you feel alive. It's precarious, it's yeah. risky, it's dangerous, it's painful, it's hurtful, it's dramatic, it's unpredictable, it's indeterminate, it's uncertain, it's horrifying, it's a horror movie. But you feel fully <laughs> alive. Every yeah. cell of you is in your body and in your mind is alive. You're on fire, absolutely on fire. We have a name. And for that. you also feel uh, I felt that he he loved me like no, he didn't never say it, but he he did things to me and took care of me. So I felt I thought that that was love. I just said that yeah. the victims <laughs> fall in love with how they are seen by the narcissist. Yeah, and they fall yeah. in love. They they fall in love with being understood. And being accepted yeah. like no other. Mm. So, but this is projection, of course. He couldn't care less about you if you were a narcissist. Mm. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure he was diagnosed. I mean, people go around and everyone no. they dislike is a narcissist. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not sure he's a narcissist, but if he were truly a narcissist, he couldn't care less about you. You're utterly, mm. but I mean utterly interchangeable, dispensable, and fungible. It's you so meant. Sad. You meant nothing to him. You meant nothing to him. The only yeah. thing that meant a lot to him is what you gave him. And yeah. then what you gave him became a nuisance and an annoyance because mm. it, it impeded his ability to devalue you. So mm. don't idealize the narrative. Don't rewrite history in your own mind. This is the trap of the victims. But I understand that being with a narcissist is a technicolor experience. And being with everyone else is black and white movie. I understand that. Boring. Yeah. I understand that. The narcissist has this capacity and borderlines even more. I myself have, have had relationships only with borderlines all my life. And I'm quite an authority on the topic. And I know everything there is to know, I think, I believe. But I can't help myself. When I'm with the borderline, I'm alive. I'm totally alive. <laughs> and when I'm not, I go through the motions. I'm robotic. I'm, yeah. I'm not depressed. 
I'm very creative and so on, but I'm I'm not alive. I don't feel alive. Mm -hmm. I know the borderline will end up hurting me, destroying me, cheating on me, doing horrible things to me. I know she will do this. Again, it's not up to her. This is an autonomous process. It has its own reason. But I can't help myself. I can't help myself because, and this is a name, it's an addiction. Victims develop addiction through exposure. It's exactly like an alcoholic. I don't know if you are aware, the recidivism, the remission rate, the relapse rate among alcoholics is 83%. Yeah, that means yeah. that eight out of 10 alcoholics, never mind how many times they went to rehab, Never mind how many families they've lost. Never mind how, many, how much time they've, they've done in prison. Never mm -hmm. mind how many people they've killed when they drove while drunk. Never mind all this. Eight out of 10 will go again to drink. They can't help themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So victims of narcissists are addicts, the junkies. And you should have a 12 steps. 12 step <laughs> program when you raise your hand at the beginning of the meeting and you say hello my name is diana and i'm an, an, i'm addicted to narcissists <laughs> and go from there and this yeah. is also why we both kind of been scared of dating again because i'm like i mean i feel like i'm just going to pick the bad one you know everything no. i think is going to be wrong no it's up to you if you yeah. feel overly if you feel overly alive if you feel dramatic, yeah. if you feel that it's not real, if you feel like you, you found yourself in a movie, because it doesn't feel real. It doesn't mm. feel real. This no, it's it, not. Yeah. effervescence, this uh, feeling of transcendence, it doesn't mm. feel real. It feels a bit hallucinatory. The minute you feel this, uh, make, make it your last date with that person. Yeah. Mm. But you're addicted to this. You can't help yourself. <laughs> oh my god yeah. oh, so no. it means like you just have to go with the ones that are boring or I you don't have know. you have to accept that life is comprised of the mundane and the routine mm -hmm. and the pedestrian and losses life is made up of losses you have mm -hmm. to accept life this is a rejection of life to team up with a narcissist as a intimate partner is because you are rejecting life and you're rejecting yeah. reality yeah, Narcissus, I tend to do that. Yeah. Narcissus offers you fantasy. That's his main, yeah. his main contribution to your life. And then you end up saying, unconsciously, you end up saying, I hate reality. I've always hated reality. Mm. And I found the solution. Here's a guy who is selling fantasy. I'm going to buy a fantasy from him. Mm. And that's how you end up with narcissists. So narcissists, true. they're victims, psychopaths and their victims, borderlines, and their victims, all of them, without exception, uh, uh, reject life. It's a joint venture at rejecting life and replacing it with fantasy. And of course, fantasy never works because reality has a nasty habit of intruding upon fantasies and challenging <laughs> them <laughs> and destroying yeah. them. So fantasies yeah. never work, They're not even in the short term, but they never work. And so it's heartbreaking. The heartbreak of the narcissist when he loses you is that he has lost the shared fantasy, not you, who doesn't care about you. They'd lost the shared mm -hmm. fantasy. But admittedly, your heartbreak also includes an element of grieving over the fantasy, mourning mm -hmm. the fantasy. What of could course. have been? What could have been? The idealized image of him, you know, mm -hmm. how you wanted him to be. You both victims and narcissists force each other, coerce each other to become what they are not. Narcissism is about absence. It's not about presence. The victim is trying to convert the narcissist into what he has never been and will never be. She rejects him as he is. The victim rejects the narcissist as he is. She says to him, as you are, you're not good to me. I want you to not be anymore. And I want you to be reborn and resurrected. It's almost religious. I want you to be reborn as someone else. And the narcissist tells you exactly the same. As you are is not good enough. I'm going to idealize you. I'm going to take a snapshot of you. I'm going to Photoshop it. I'm going to idealize you. 
and then I expect you to disappear as you are and to reappear in the shape mm. of the idealized image. image. Mm. And Narcissus' fantasy and your collaboration, your collusion with him in his fantasy is about killing each other. It's a death fantasy. It's a death cult. You are trying to kill the narcissist as he is and to make him into a different person, an ideal person, the person you would have wanted him to be. In your imagination, nothing to do with him, actually. And he's trying to do the same to you. It's a joint death cult. The narcissist operates on the fanatic principle, on the, on the, on the death force, not on libido, not on the life force. He is operating on the death force because the narcissist has been assassinated as a small child. The narcissist is a walking, talking corpse. It's a zombie, real, real zombie. Not, not so are they, they just gonna, are they just just gonna go ahead and continue doing this till they die? Like yes. just new, cause they can't stay with one partner throughout life, right? Well, I've never investigated narcissists in the afterlife. But I, <laughs> I, I, yes, they're going to do that until they die. Yeah. Uh, they, they can stay with one partner. There is something, a concept that I, I was the first to describe. It's called the island of stability. Uh, narcissists and psychopaths have one island of stability and all the rest is chaos. Mm. So, for example, they have a marriage which lasts 40 years. But they change, they change 25 jobs. So the island of stability is the marriage and the chaos is the career or the professional life. Mm. Or opposite. They yeah, work well, in the yeah. same company for 50 years and they become the chief executive mm. officer of the company. But in the meantime, they divorce and remarry six times. Right. So the island of stability is the career and the professional life. and So, so it's possible for the Nazis to remain with the same partner in the long term. And if he's cerebral, he will not cheat on. If he's somatic, he will. Uh, there's no type constancy. Narcissists oscillate between somatic and cerebral. When they collapse, where when they are unable to secure supply, they change from cerebral to somatic and from somatic to cerebral and so on. So it's guaranteed that you will be cheated on at some point because yeah. it will become somatic at some point. And if you're willing to live with this, open marriage, or, or, or what, if you're willing to live with this, then yeah, you could have a very long-term relationship with the Nazis if you are his island of stability. But then you, you become fixated in the role of the mother. It's extremely unlikely that you will have sex with such a person because of the incest, element of incest in his mind. You become more and more of a mother. So it will be very difficult for him to have sex with you. And he will begin to develop with you the dynamics of that he used to have with his mother or that the child has with his mother. Mm -hmm. So expect rebelliousness, teenage rebelliousness, except you know, all the dynamics of which a mother goes through. Mm -hmm. You will have just a child, like a child. And he will remain attached to you for 40 years, but he will be your child for 40 years. Wow. Well, that's not a relationship. <laughs> That's not something I want to. I wouldn't. I wouldn't generalize. There are women who who find this a very attractive proposition. I wouldn't generalize. I would I'd be very careful. Yeah. There are quite a yeah. few women who find this, and men, by the way, who find this an attractive proposition. By the way, the dynamic with a with a female narcissist is identical. It's not about a father. It's about a mother. It's always the mother, not the father. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So she also has problems with, with the mother. Even if the mother is perfect and truly loving and truly caring and so on, she would have trouble separating from her. That mm -hmm. could be an issue with the father. So she doesn't dare to separate from the mother because she has bad relationship with the father. But it's always the mother. So when a female narcissist teams up with a, ma with a man, with an intimate partner, mm -hmm. or with a woman, I mean, with a partner, and uh, she would become... She would, she would maternalize the partner. She would convert the partner into a mother figure. And so she could stay with the partner for 40 years, but he or she would, would be a mother figure. It's identical. And this is, this is my work on dual mothership. That's the concept. Yeah, we saw that one. Dual yeah. mothership. We watched your video. <laughs> yeah. My apologies. We're making, uh, my apologies we're making, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, well, we're making a podcast uh, here in Norway. And yes, we, so. It's actually going really yeah. well. Everybody's interested because the topic hasn't been spoken on here in Norwegian. So yeah, and, and yeah. I was um, uh, I was going through something in in me because I was not sure if I I wanted to to make a podcast because I was afraid that my ex would hear it and I, I don't know how he would react. But I, I decided to do it anyway for for me and to help other who who are or your, has been in the same situation. Is your ex violent or aggressive? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, he is he is not violent, but he's uh, he is aggressive. Aggressive. That's something else. Yeah. If your ex if your ex hasn't been violent or aggressive, it would have been interesting to bring him on camera and talk to him. Yeah. Well, I don't no. think you no, no, that's a bad idea. If he's aggressive and violent, it's a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. But he has a new girlfriend, so... That's an aggressive act. <laughs> he, has moved, yeah. he has moved on. He moved on right away. Yeah. All right. oh, yeah, only one, only, only yeah. one month after we ended I, it. I told you, you meant nothing to him. Yeah, yeah, yes, I know, I know. But that, that takes a little time to process, you know? Because uh, you, assume, you assume that you're a human being to him. You assume that he recognizes your separateness, that you're yeah. an entity. You're not an entity, yeah. you're a function. Yeah. It's like I would never get attached to the electrician that comes to fix my, my electricity. <laughs> no, question, <laughs> oh no question of attachment here. It's ridiculous. Yeah. No, I don't no. even see him, I don't even see him as a person. I'm not asking him how's your family and what you know. No, he's just here. He's just here to fix my electricity. Yeah. Is, you're a service provider. Think of yourself That's as a with the narcissist. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You're a service wow. provider. That, that that takes yeah. some time, you know, to to cope and process. <laughs> By the way, that's the, the that's the best case. That you're an electrician, that's the best case. He could consider you not as an electrician, but as a refrigerator, yeah. as an object, <laughs> totally objectified yeah. and dehumanized. So then he would yeah. not even see you as a human figure that provides services. He would see you as an object, total object. Yeah. You're like a That's... bus. You're like a bus. It's very uncomfortable to miss the bus, but you can rest assured another one is coming. Yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> That's right so around true. the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, miss when another one is coming. Yeah. I think Ludacris has a song about that. Yeah. yeah. It's oh, really man. enlightening to hear you yeah. speak about this topic. My pleasure. We're, we're, we're yeah. a big fan of you. <laughs> and are you okay with we're taping this for our podcast, just the voices that we put on? Yeah. You can Perfect. do anything you want with the images, with the voices. Uh, Thank I'm, you. Yeah. Um, and of course, you give me permission to post this on YouTube. Of course. YouTube. Yeah. Okay. We need yeah. it to come yeah. You can also do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Thank it you. That's, that's if okay. you have any further questions, I'm here. And if not, it's been a true pleasure. So thank you. Very grateful to have this. Thank you very to... much. Very thank you. My Appreciate pleasure. it. It's a good initiative to educate people who are not exposed to the message, to educate yeah. them about narcissistic abuse. Because narcissistic abuse is unlike any other type of abuse. That's the reason I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse in 1995, because I couldn't find anything remotely similar to this. All other types of abuse focus on a dimension. So financial abuse focuses on your money. Physical abuse focuses on your body. Verbal abuse and psychological abuse focuses on your mind. Abuse is dimensional. It's goal-oriented. It's highly specific. It's like laser. Only narcissistic abuse focuses on eliminating you as an independent, autonomous, and agentic entity. It's the only total abuse, only form of total abuse that we are aware of. So yes, it's a risk, it's a danger. And it's a danger because the numbers of narcissists are increasing exponentially. That's not me, these are studies by Twenge and Campbell and many others. The numbers are increasing exponentially. Society is built now to reward narcissists. So if you're a narcissist, your chances to end up on top, successful, et cetera, mm. are much higher. Even in 2016, the famous science magazine, New Scientist, came up with a cover in July 2016. And the cover said, parents, teach your children to be narcissists. Wow. Narcissist. And their, their whole group of academics, they are glorifying narcissism. They're glamorizing narcissism. 
they're saying that narcissism and psychopathy are very good evolutionary steps. We need narcissists and psychopaths. And they're high functioning and they can show us the way and they can protect us. Quite a few academics are saying this. Kevin Dutton, Macobi, I can give you many names. It's very dangerous because it's becoming an ideology and the equivalent of a religion. The narcissist, narcissism is a private religion. Narcissism is godlike, is a divinity. It's a confluence of ideology, religion, social functioning, and, inter and, and interpersonal relationships. This could be a defining feature of our future if we don't fight back. And already I'm very afraid it's too late. Yeah. Already I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, guys, it was a pleasure. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank we you. love you. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Okay, let me see how this works.